I'm going to show you our entire global monetary system in 15 minutes. Now, I'm going to have to simplify things a bit, but this is also going to help you understand a bunch of current geopolitics, such as tariffs, stable coins, and global debates about the role of the US dollar as a reserve currency. Let's get started. So an economy is always an interconnected web of people who use the planet's resources or ecosystems to survive. So let's picture such an economy 20,000 years ago with eight people on a small island. Now that economy is going to be very, very small because all economies are always limited by how many people there are and how many things there are for them to work with. So that group of eight people on that island is actually a single system. But that system can have a whole series of subsystems within it. So for example, let's look at two people within the eight people. Those two people can go in and out of debt to each other. Now, when I say debt here, I don't mean monetary debt. I'm just talking about an imbalance in labor. If you want to understand this, think about, for example, when a friend does a favor for you. So picture, for example, your friend helping you to move house. If they do that, you will feel a sense of debt to them, that you kind of owe them something in future. They, by contrast, will have a sense of positive credit. They'll have this kind of confidence that they can call upon you in future. In fact, you might immediately try to offer them dinner in return, trying to to restore that balance. Now, balance is a very good concept here, and I'd like to use a seesaw to represent this. So let's go back to our island and think about person A contributing labor to help person B. Picture the weight of that labor unbalancing the relationship between those two people, pushing the latter into the negative while the former ends up with positive credits relative to the latter. Basically, one of them goes below zero and the other one goes above zero. Now, in this context, there's no formal accounting. They're not keeping an exact measurement of these balances. They'll just have a rough sort of feeling, a kind of rough intuition that there's this imbalance between them. And this will leave person B with the sense that sometime in future, they should probably seek to restore that balance and bring the seesaw back into equality. Let's now imagine a scenario where person B now does something for a third person C, gaining positive credits relative to them. So in the context of this three person system, they're actually in a neutral position with the positive credits canceling out the negative. Person A, by contrast, has only positive credits or person C only has negative credits. So now if person C does something for person A, that three person system is going to balance out to equality again. Each person will now have both positive and negative credits, which will offset each other. In a sense, what's happened is that person C has extinguished their debt with person B by extinguishing person B's debt with person A. Note here that we end up with a bunch of stuff produced. You have a bunch of labor moving around doing stuff, but the credits have all equaled out to zero again. So the credits expanded and they contracted while the amount of stuff went up. Now that three person system is set within that larger eight person system that we started with. And at this scale, the possible combinations get a lot more complex. You can have individual people, but also subgroups moving in and out of debt to each other. So let's imagine a kind of web of enmeshed seesaws. Now those positive and negative signs represent people who are in credit or debt in labor terms, but they're always net out to zero because for one person to go positive, somebody else has to go negative. Now, at this point, it's important to introduce two disclaimers. Firstly, in these small scale scenarios, having positive credits generally reflects that you have contributed work and that you can expect something back from the group as a result of that. In much larger scale systems, though, having large amounts of positive credits doesn't necessarily reflect that you've done a whole lot of work. In fact, in large scale systems, unequal amounts of positive credits often accrue to people in positions of power or to people who've accumulated a large amount of ownership and stuff, rather than people who've done a lot of work. That'll have to be a topic for another video, though. Secondly, in most small scale communities, whether you're talking about a family, a group of friends, or some ancient hunter-gatherer band, these webs of credit are informal, which basically means people aren't keeping an exact quote-unquote score, and they're not expecting an exact return in future. Rather, what tends to happen is people just have a rough sense of these balances held in communal memory and a rough sense that reciprocity will play out over time. Now, in much larger systems, though, these webs of credit tend to get formalized. OK, let's get a bit more complex now. Let's imagine that a group of eight people has some kind of unbalanced relationship with some kind of external power. Perhaps, for example, they're menaced by a warlord from a neighboring island who has a militia and who threatens the people and who demands tribute from them. Now, let's say that rather than simply sacking the island and thereby destroying the means of their tribute, the warlord has a more sophisticated method. So let's look at what this warlord does. He issues credits to these people in token form, representing the labor and energy that they've given him. 
Now, in a sense, these credits represent the kind of debt that this monarch owes to these people. Because bear in mind, the monarch has got a bunch of stuff from them and therefore theoretically should be repaying these people at some point. But this monarch has no intention of repaying these people by handing back labor and stuff at some point in future. Here's the trick. What the monarch does is simply demands the credits back at certain intervals, telling the people that they need to hand these credits back in order to extinguish or to neutralize another form of debt that the monarch now demands from them called tax. Now this is a very crude story that I've just given and actually the issuance of tokens by monarchs historically is far more complex than this but the basic deal is that a monarch is issuing tokens to get stuff from people and then later demands those tokens back in order to eliminate the positive credit obtained by those people. This is basically used to mask violence aka the monarch is saying I am more powerful than you and if you do not hand those tokens back to me my militias will come and beat you up or kill you. Now, this use of tokens to extract stuff from the island has a bunch of interesting side effects. Firstly, the people in our eight-person system continue to have relationships between each other. But as a system overall, they are in positive relative to this external power. Crucially, those positive credits issued out by that external power can actually start to be used between themselves within this network to measure their relative balances relative to each other. This is really the primal vibe of what we'd call a monetary system. Now we saw that the relative positions of people in that eight person network always net out to zero because to go positive, somebody else has to go negative. But what happens when that eight person network is now on the receiving end of a bigger seesaw with this powerful player on the other side issuing tokens? Well, what happens is that their zero line goes upwards. Their zero line between themselves gets pulled upwards as this monarch goes downwards into the negative. In a sense, the zero between between them gets renamed with a positive number. Let's arbitrarily choose some numbers to reflect this. Let's say the monarch goes minus 10 as they issue tokens to get stuff from the people. That means the network as a whole on the other side has gone plus 10. Now everything nets out to 10 on this side because somewhere else on the liability side or the issuance side, there's somebody else with a minus 10. Now in our everyday experience of money, we're a bit like this network of people on the positive side of that seesaw. We experience money as positively numbered units that we move between ourselves. But those positively numbered units only exist because because somewhere else in the system there's a gigantic negative number and in our system that negative number resides in the state, the central bank and the banking sector. So let's take this last image and scale it up to modernize each component. So unlike an island with eight people, a modern national economy is a gigantic web of millions of people. Let's visualize that like this here. Those lines between the people are intended to just generically represent the enmeshed webs of interdependence between them, or the seesaws that we saw in our earlier eight person image. Let's now represent our king in a new form too, as a conglomeration of monetary institutions with commercial banks clustering around a central bank backed by state power. Now I'm well aware that I'm glossing over an enormous amount of detail here. The main point right now is just to get a basic sense or a conceptual model that you can fill out. I'm going to represent society on the positive end of a seesaw with the banking sector and the state on the negative side. Let's now slightly alter it in a slightly counterintuitive way. Now let's rotate this image around 90 degrees so it ends up like this with the seesaw on a vertical axis rather than a horizontal one. Now imagine that big seesaw on that vertical axis is being constituted by various sub seesaws controlled by different banks connected to the central bank but collectively spreading out out positive credits across the population. Okay, so we now have a very rough but workable image of our monetary system. On the horizontal dimension at a ground level, we have a huge network of people with ties of horizontal interdependence between them, but we're using positive number credits between ourselves that come from these big institutions. Those positive units of money only exist because there's a giant hidden negative number that sits in that vertical dimension in the banking sector in the state, both of which push credits out and pull them back in. Now we can go into the specific elements of money issuers and the different levels of money issuers, but right now I just see them as a single complex. So our monetary system is this multi-layered hierarchical complex administered by commercial banks, central banks, state treasuries, and so on. But it ends up functioning like a giant accounting system that keeps track of all the different scores that we have relative to each other on that horizontal plane. Now, I just want to reiterate something here. In a modern system, those quote unquote scores that people have do not necessarily represent work done. They often represent your level of power and your level of ownership in the economy. But let's leave that topic aside for another day. 
So having created this national image, we must then note that actually each national economy with its national currency is but one subsystem within the international system. Because after all, we live in a global economy. So let's go back to that image of our eight person island. But now let's imagine each person as an entire country. So this image shows a whole series of countries with a mesh of seesaws between themselves. They can go positive and negative relative to each other. This is what economists will be talking about when they talk about trade surpluses and trade deficits. A trade surplus is when a country is positive relative to another. A trade deficit is when it's negative. This image will also help you to understand the international payment system and foreign trade. Let's take one random person in one of the countries and then trace a path through their banking sector to another person in another country. When you pay for goods internationally, for example, when you click buy on a website that's offering goods from foreign sellers, a bunch of banks have to do business with each other to settle things on behalf of citizens and companies. Having said that, it's worth noting that a huge amount of international trade between countries actually happens by them using a single currency between themselves, and that currency is the US dollar. This is what we call the US dollar reserve system. To visualize that, imagine that network of countries having an unbalanced relationship with the US and using its credits to mediate trade between themselves. Now let's do that same little trick we did earlier and shift the orientation slightly and then swing that seesaw 90 degrees to a vertical axis. Then we can pull those two sides in to create an image of the US dollar as a kind of ruling monarch of the international system. Now this position gives the US certain powers. In fact, some people refer to this as the exorbitant privilege experienced by the US. Essentially, the US can go way more into the negative than the average country can. And it gets a bunch of other special powers. For example, lower borrowing costs due to high and consistent demand for US dollars from other countries. This image actually might help you if you're trying to understand a bunch of current geopolitics around money. For example, for the rest of the world to use the US dollar as a reserve currency between themselves, they have to, theoretically at least, run a trade surplus relative to the US. I.e. they got to be getting positive US dollar credits by giving the US stuff and then not handing those credits back to the US to get stuff back. This, again, theoretically leads to what sometimes is called the Triffin Dilemma. In essence, the US can choose to remain in this position of having the world's reserve currency and get a bunch of stuff and power from that. But it only does so by remaining in the negative. Now, some people, for example, Stephen Moran, Trump's economic advisor, argues that this leads to a bunch of problems, such as an overvalued US dollar, which slowly deindustrializes the US. And this is partially why they argue for tariffs. They want to try to change the situation of the US being a deficit country. But if they do that, it theoretically could undermine their position as a reserve currency. I say theoretically because the world is more complex than this model. And actually, there's ways for countries to get access to US dollars beyond running trade surpluses with the US. That's a more complex topic which involves diving into the financial sector, but we can do that another time. Another hot topic right now is the fact that the US is trying to push private sector players to issue US dollar stablecoins, which are digital vouchers for US dollars, in an effort to directly undermine the national sub-networks beneath it and to make the world's population more dependent on the US dollar for everyday transactions between citizens, even within their own countries. There's a whole bunch of very naive tech and crypto people who think this is great for the world's population, but it's basically an imperialistic play. Now, obviously, I'm leaving out a huge amount of detail here and a huge amount of complexity. For example, I've left out the entire financial system and the bond markets. Hopefully, though, this has given you a slight sense of how that sense of debt that you feel when somebody helps you move house actually has a large scale counterpart in the international system. Be careful, though, to add in differences of power when you change those scales because power actually alters the nature of debt. Think about a giant player saying something like, you will help me move house and you'll be grateful because I will issue you my precious tokens and you'll become dependent on those tokens to survive. Big players experience being in the negative in a different way to how we experience that situation. Hope you've enjoyed and see you next time.